the morning. Now it's time for the beginning of the class. So one of the questions that you had was whether people can make new materials and how new materials are made. And definitely the answer is yes, new materials are made all the time. And so how is that done? Well, usually, and actually, in fact, my PhD dissertation involved the making of new materials. My PhD was based on making new materials as a cathode for secondary lithium ion batteries. So for batteries that you have a cathode and an anode, I worked on the cathode part. And the materials that I made were through what is called the Soljol process. So I made oxides that don't exist in nature. And the salt gel process is a basically a chemistry process to create new materials. So how do people do that? How do people make new materials? Well, first of all, you start by thinking about the properties that you want. So I won't talk about my particular material. It's a little more esoteric, which means outside of the norm. So I'll talk about something that you have a lot of experience with, and that is indium tin oxides, ITO. So ITO is used as a transparent, electrically conducting layer in many electrical or electronic devices. Okay, so for many, like cell phones and other kinds of um, things, you need a screen that is transparent, but you also need it if you're going to have a touch screen or things like that, you need it to somehow be able to sense something, right? A lot of the sensing is done electrically. And so you need something that's both transparent and conducting. So you start by saying, okay, this is what we need. We need something that's both transparent and conducting. And we need to think about what are the structures in a material that can lead to conductivity. So we will actually talk about that today. And what are some of the structures in a material that will lead to a material being transparent? And then you try to figure out if there are elements that you can put together, materials that you can form to create something that has both of those characteristics. And indium tin oxide or ITO, you have what are called free electrons. So electrons that can move around, so that's electrically conducting. So you have to, scientists thought about, and engineers thought about what can make an oxide, which is a ceramic material, have these free or movable mobile electrons. And so they looked at the structure and then decided how to put something, uh, make a material that can do both. And hopefully this will make a little bit more sense as we talk about today's class. So in today's class, we want to understand material structure, but before we could do that, we need to review some chemistry. And the good thing is, I think a lot of you mentioned in your survey that you like chemistry, so hopefully this will be just a review for you. So when we talk about material structure, we are going to start with just a single atom. So when we talk about material structure, a lot of it is based on how the electrons are organized around the nucleus. And so we're going to be talking about the atomic model. And this is probably the electron, the atomic model that you are familiar with, right? This is called the Bohr model. And basically it has a nucleus, which is proton. So hopefully this is all really simple review for you. Nucleus has protons and neutrons. Okay. Neutrons have no charge. Protons have charge. They're positively charged. And therefore, the nucleus is positively charged. And the nucleus is surrounded by electrons. And the electrons are negatively charged. And the electrons have some sort of structure to the way they surround the nucleus. And you know that you have the 1s orbital, the 2s orbital, 2p, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is sort of the traditional way of representing an atom. 
but I am sure that you also know that this is not actually accurate. This is just a very simple way of drawing the um, atom, but that the actual structure looks more like this. So at the center of all of these x, y, and z axis is the nucleus. That's the nucleus is at the origin. And you have these different orbitals. So the, these colored shapes are the orbitals for the electrons. The S is a shape of a sphere. And P is these lobes that go along the X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis. And then the D is a, yet another shape. And then you have the F orbital, which is another shape. Okay. And what this diagram is showing you is the different shapes that these different orbitals have. And so electrons are like people in the sense that electrons always want to occupy the lowest energy possible. And so like most of us, if we could lie down instead of stand up, we rather lie down, it's easier. People like to occupy the lowest energy state possible, just like electrons. And so the electron energy levels are shown by how much energy it takes to be in those electron shells. And the reason why only two electrons can be in the 1s orbital is based on the Pauli exclusion principle. So the Pauli exclusion principle says that no two identical fermions can occupy the same energy level. So no two identical fermions. So this is something that you may or may not know about, but basically in terms of particles, elementary particles, such as electrons and protons and other elementary particles, there are two types. One is a fermion and one is a boson. Fermions have a non-integer spin. So, and bosons have an integer spin. And so these are things that are not really important for you to remember. But the only important thing to remember here is that electrons are fermions. Okay, they have a non-integer spin. Electrons can be plus one half spin or negative one half spin. So that's not an integer spin. So because electrons are fermions, no two identical electrons can occupy any one energy level. So if you have an energy level 1s, as shown here, you can only have two electrons that go in that energy level because one can be positive one half and one can be negative one half or spin up and spin down, right? So those two electrons can occupy the same energy level because they have two different spins. They're not identical. And then so if you look at the p orbitals here, now it's hopefully fairly obvious why a p orbital can hold six electrons. Because electrons can be along the x-axis, two of them, because you have spin up, spin down. Two of them can occupy this energy level along the z-axis, and two of them can occupy this level along the y-axis. Okay. And then in terms of the d, can you enter into the chat how many electrons do you think can exist in the d orbital? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Okay. I see someone put in 10. Anyone else have any other thoughts besides 10? Okay, 10. And why is that? Why is 10? 10 is correct. Why is 10 the number? Right, because there are five different ways that this orbital can exist. And in each one of these ways that the orbitals can exist, you could fit two electrons in. Perfect. And then what about in the f orbital? How many electrons would you expect to be able to, right? Because you have seven different ones, two electrons in each, 14. Great. Right, so here we show the energy state. Before it was the schematic a shape showing you what they might look like. Now we're showing you the energy level, right? So we know that the 1s is the lowest energy level for electrons to exist in. Next one is the 2s, then the 2p, then 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, and so forth. 
Okay. And so this is something that you should know, but you don't have to memorize. It's easy enough to look up online. But basically know that there are different energy levels for each of these orbitals and that electrons will always fill the lowest energy level first. So they will always start with the 1s and fill upwards. Okay. So now let's look at the periodic table. We know the periodic table is organized by the number of protons and electrons that each element has. Hopefully you're all very familiar with reading the periodic table. If you could enter into the chat, how many electrons do you think helium, HE, has? Okay, two, very good. How do you know this? What tells you that a typical helium atom will have two electrons? Okay, based on the atomic number. So atomic number is up here, it says a two. Okay, does anyone know how atomic numbers are arrived at? What does the atomic number tell you? It doesn't actually tell you the number of electrons. Atomic number tells you the number of what? Very good, protons. Right. So atomic number tells you the number of protons. We know most elements or atoms will exist in a neutral state. So that most likely an element with the atomic number of seven, which is nitrogen, has seven protons, which will also mean that it has seven electrons. Okay, so very good. And so let's take beryllium, Be here. What do you think the atom, the electronic structure will be like for beryllium? It has, we know it has, it has an atomic number of four, so it has four protons, will have four electrons. So how would that, those four electrons be organized around the nucleus? How many will be in the 1s orbital? and so on and so forth, okay? 1s2, so the 1s2 means it has two electrons in the 1s, and then two electrons in the 2s. So write 1s2 and 2s2. That's how you write the electronic configuration of beryllium. What about for oxygen, something very common that we all need to exist? Number eight, and I can remind you here, if you have eight electrons, how would they fill? Excellent. Okay. So two in the 1s, two in the 2s. We could fit six in the 2p. We don't have another six left over. We just have four because we have eight total electrons. So we have four more in the 2p. Okay. All right. And so the electrons that we're talking about, it is important for us to know that valence electrons. So how many valence electrons would carbon have? Carbon has a valence electron of four, right? It has a total number of six electrons, two are in the 1s, that's a filled and that's an inner shell, two are in the two, 2s, and then two more in the 2p. So it has four total electrons in the two orbital or the two shell, and so it has four valence electrons. How about silicon, another really common element? Anyone can tell me how many valence electrons exist in silicon? Okay, four. So you could, you know, do this at home. You could write down out the entire electron, uh, electronic configuration for silicon, and you will see that it has four in the outermost shell. What about geranium? here, GE. How many valence electrons? Okay, again, four. So I know that some of you are not doing the full electronic configuration because geranium has 20, 32 electrons. So it'll take you a little bit time to write out the full electronic configuration. So what you're doing, obviously, is looking at the periodic table. And you know that everything in this column has a valence electron of four. And everything in this column has a valence electron number of five. Everything here has a valence electron number of six. And so it goes like this. Number of valence electrons in the first row is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, right? What about the transition metals here in the middle? 
how many valence electrons would iron have? So iron, I'll write down the configuration for iron. Okay. And so iron actually has eight valence electrons. It has these one, two, three, four, five, six in the 3D, and then two in the 4S. So for valence electrons, you basically just count. For the first elements in these two columns, there's just one and two, and then everything in here is three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then everything down here in the transition metals, you count the first two plus everything in that row. So ruthenium will also have eight valence electrons. Manganese would have seven. Cobalt would have nine. Okay. And so you see that the periodic table of elements is arranged really conveniently for us to see how many valence electrons there are, right? It's everything is kind of orderly. Does anyone know how the periodic table was put together? It was done a long time ago. So it was actually done by chemists who looked at the properties of individual elements and then grouped them based on common properties that they exhibited based on, you know, with what other elements do they typically combine? How are they combined? What kind of bonding do they have? What are the material properties after they're bounded? So, so on and so forth. So actually, at that time when chemists put together the periodic table of elements, they were not aware of these electronic orbitals. They did not put it together based on the electronic orbitals. So to me, I feel like it's quite amazing that the periodic table matches so well with the actual electronic configuration of the elements because they were done, there were two things that were discovered independently of each other. Okay, so to me that also shows that the valence electrons, because really it's these groups are kind of based on the number of valence electrons. So this really shows us that the valence electrons are very, very critical in material properties. So I just want to emphasize that. Okay, so valence electrons are critical in determining material properties, and that's why Intro to Material Science starts with reviewing the electronic configuration and knowing how many electrons are in a material, how many valence electrons. This is not just something to memorize, but it really is critical in knowing how materials will behave. And for me, personally, I think it's amazing any element in an atom, 99.999% of the mass comes from the protons and the neutrons. The electrons have very, very little mass in compared to protons and neutrons. But it's the electrons that are mainly determining the properties of materials and not the protons and the neutrons. So for me, that's amazing. And also, it's not all of the electrons. Most of the time, it's the valence electrons, the electrons in the outermost shell that are um, determining the properties of materials. So we'll talk about why that is. Before I go there, just wanted to go back to the periodic table, introduce an idea, or maybe it's not introduced, review the idea of electropositive elements and electronegative elements. So electropositive elements are elements that can give up electrons. So they have low electronegativity. So this is kind of have to just memorize this because the names all sound kind of the same, positive, negative, electro. So electropositive elements want to give up their electrons and they have low electronegativity and electronegative elements gain electrons, they tend to gain electrons, and they have high electronegativity. And so if you are looking at the periodic table of elements here, to which side, to the left side or to the right side, would you expect to have electropositive elements? So electropositive elements are ones that want to give up electrons. 
So this side, the left side, is electropositive elements because they only have a few electrons in the outermost shell. It is easier for them to give up those electrons than to gain a lot of extra electrons to fill that outermost shell. Okay. Does anyone know why electrons want to have a full outermost shell as opposed to a partially empty outermost shell? Okay, to be stable. Why, why does that make them stable? So here's a little hint on your tests and any of anything else that you're working on with me for this class, that if you say this as an answer, you will always be right. If the elements have occupy a lowest energy state, that's where they're the most stable. And so while having a full outermost shell, elements are more stable because they are then occupying the lowest possible energy. Okay, so that's why elements with a few extra electrons want to give them away because by giving them in the way, they can actually occupy a lower energy state. And elements that are electronegative will then obviously be on the right-hand side because they want to gain electrons because their outermost shell is almost full. By gaining just the one or two more electrons, they will then have a full outermost shell as opposed to giving away six or seven electrons. Okay. Any questions so far about the electronic configuration, how to calculate valence electrons, how many there are, how to correlate valence electrons to the periodic table of elements, and then just the concept of electropositive elements wanting to give up their electrons, and electronegative elements wanting to gain electrons. Then let's go on to bonding. So now that we know how individual elements are kind of put together, what happens when more than one, when you have more than one atom? So if you have more than one atom in a material, which we know is normal, you will have typically bonding. So we'll talk about bonding. You will have three different types. Three types of primary bonding. You have ionic, covalent, and metallic. So you have three types of primary bonds. So the first one is ionic. All right. An ionic bond is when elements with different electronegativities come together. So when you have an element that wants to get rid of its electrons come next to an element that wants to gain electrons, then it makes sense for there to be a transfer of electrons. And so this is what this schematic is showing. Obviously, it's not what it actually looks like. It's just a schematic showing the concept. Okay. So if we look at the periodic table, can you name some elements that might form ionic bonds? Like if you put some of them together, what, what might you be able to put together to have a material, right? The most common one that we know of is NaCl. You have Na in column one. It, needs, it has one valence electron. Cl in column seven, it has seven valence electrons. And they could gain seven electrons to full outermost shell, or Cl can gain, or it could give away one electron to have a full outermost shell. Cl can either gain one electron to have a full outermost shell or give away seven. So it makes sense for Na to give one to Cl. Both of them are happy. Okay. Magnesium oxide. Actually, magnesium, yep, here we are, magnesium oxide. Okay two valence electron of two, and then oxygen has a valence electron of six. And so, yeah, if you just match things up, right, lithium and oxygen can also form an ionic bond. You will have two lithium atoms to one oxygen atom, right? Okay, calcium oxide is another one, C, A, and O, valence electron of two valence electron of six. Okay, 
So when things are opposite sides, when they come together, they tend to form ionic bonds. Okay. So what are some properties of ionic bonding? So ionic bonding, you see that there's a transfer. So what happens is that the electrons are then localized. In ionic bonds, electrons are localized. They're kind of stuck to the atom that did the bonding. Okay, because one had to be given away, and then now it's part of the outermost shell of another atom. And so it's kind of stuck in that weight, in that area. And if you were to move it, then both of these, if you were to move the electron, then both of these elements would be, be not in their lowest energy state. So they would be unhappy. Okay, so electrons are localized. So that means that electrons are not able to move around easily. And therefore, they're typically not conducting, so non-conducting. Okay? If you have ionic materials, they're usually not electrically conducting. But because there's a strong need for things to stay that where they are, that bond is actually very strong. So it's a strong bond. And materials are typically brittle. So they cannot bend without breaking. So having ionic materials means that they're typically electro electrically not conducting. They have a very strong bond. They form a strong material, but they're typically brittle. The next one that we have, the next type of bond is covalent. Covalent is when you have elements with similar electronegativities come together will give you a covalent bond. Okay, so that means that both of them want to gain electrons. Okay, so really common one is if you look at nitrogen and oxygen, right? They're both electro, are they electronegative or are they electropositive? Nitrogen and oxygen. They're both on the right side of the periodic table, which makes them electronegative, right? Okay, so um, both want to gain electrons. So instead of one trying to take electrons away from another, they tend to just share them. Okay, you can see that here. Okay, so carbon is a really common one that people talk about. Let's see, carbon here forms a very strong covalent bond. Oxygen, nitrogen, and oxygen. So anything that's kind of here would be would form covalent bonds. So again. That electrons are localized. Okay, so they will have similar properties to ionic materials. They will be not conducting, typically brittle and strong. So in order to move that electron that's being shared here, you are going to have to break apart that bond and therefore the materials will not end up in their lowest energy state, and they don't want to do that, so the bonds are strong, the electrons are kind of stuck in place, so they are, cannot conduct, and the material is brittle. Then the last type of primary bond is metallic. Metallic bonding happens when you have things that all want to kind of give away of some of their electrons. But, so if we look at the periodic table, so when you have electropositive materials that share their electrons, they all kind of want to give them away. So what happens is that they just contribute them to this kind of, again, this is a schematic. It's not what it actually looks like, but they contribute their excess electrons, their valence electrons to this cloud of electrons. Okay, so metallic materials is when electropositive elements come together. Okay. So they give away their electrons, they form this electron cloud. And as you might suspect, that means that the electrons, because they're kind of in this shared cloud, so electrons are not localized. Material can bend without breaking and are electrically conducting. And so you can see that if the electrons can move around, so if you have a, a potential difference, the electrons can flow due to that potential difference from one end to the other.
without any of the bonds being broken. They can move around. And if you wanted to move an atom from here to a different position, it also would not necessarily break the same kind of bond that an ionic or covalent material might have to break because you're not actually asking the electrons to be moved necessarily, right? The, the electrons can just move around. And so the bonds are not quite as strong and materials can bend or the atoms can move without the material breaking. Okay, so that has to do with the metallic bonding. So these are all fairly idealized pictures of what materials will look like. Of course, there is any real material will be more complicated than that. So most materials will have mixed bonding. So that means that you can have both ionic and metallic existing or ionic and covalent existing in one particular material. So if you have something like calcium carbonate, so that is CaCO3, okay? In a material like cal calcium carbonate, you will have both ionic. So the ionic will be between the Ca and the CO3. And then the covalent will be between the C and the O and the CO3. Okay? So you can have materials that have a mixture of bonding, and that's totally normal. All right. So that's primary bonding. I wanted just to talk about, I think the last thing I wanted to talk about, yes, is secondary bonding. And then after we talk about secondary bonding, we'll go talk about our project. So secondary bonding. No electrons are transferred or shared. Okay, so primary bonding, ionic, metallic, and covalent have shared or transferred electrons, secondary bonding have no shared or transferred electrons. So the way secondary bonding works, and I think somebody put in HB probably for hydrogen bonding, that's correct. So secondary bonding is also called like van der Waals bond and a specific type of secondary bonding is hydrogen bonding. So let's talk about how materials can bond when there are no electrons being transferred or shared. And this has to do with what are called dipoles. D2 dipoles. So dipoles are materials with two poles. So a positive end and a negative end. Okay, it's a dipole. All right. So here are two examples of how dipoles can be formed. So you can have something that's called induced dipole. I'll write that down. Okay, so you have something here that's an induced dipole is when you have an element that has is symmetrical, there's no positive end to it or a negative end to this element. It's the same number of negative charges that surround a positive charge. Okay, so symmetrical, no charge. Okay. But we know that sometimes when you bring those two things together, you can actually create a positive end and a negative end to it. And so sometimes you start to pull the electrons one way. So if you look at this picture here, it's showing that this element has slightly more electrons on one side than this side. And so that means it will have a negative, uh, overall negative charge, very small, but still overall negative, and a slightly positive charge on one end. So when you bring that element next to this atom, it's also going to create a dipole. So this atom, because it has a positive end and a negative end to it, is also going to pull the electrons from this atom to slightly be on this side, electrons to be on this side, and then create a dipole here. So this has a negative end and a positive end. So that's what is called the induced dipole. So you're, the element by itself, the atom by itself is neutral. It doesn't have poles, a charge to either side, any of the shape. But because you're bringing another element or atom that has a small dipole, it could actually create a dipole in this normally neutral material. Okay. And once you have this induced dipole, they're going to attract each other, right? So there is going to be a small attraction. There's no sharing or transferring of electrons. 
but there will be a small attraction between these two atoms. Okay, so that's a secondary bond. And a very specific kind of secondary bond is what is called a hydrogen bond. And it's called hydrogen bond because it often exists when you have hydrogen around. And this is H2O. Everyone knows H2O is water. Hopefully you also know that H2O, the molecule kind of looks like a Mickey Mouse as a, or a face and two years, right? Okay, so that's just the way the molecule is formed. That's how the bonding works. It has this shape to it. So water molecules are what are called permanent dipoles. So because, first of all, what kind of bonding do you think hydrogen and oxygen would form? You have hydrogen here and oxygen here. What kind of primary bonding do you think forms between hydrogen and oxygen? Very good. You all got it right. But it, doesn't it look like it should be ionic? Because you have hydrogen as an electropositive element and oxygen as an electronegative. Okay, it is covalent. Okay, because hydrogen really only needs one electron to be fulfilled because it doesn't have any electrons in the 2s, right? So it really only needs one. So it could share that one electron. It doesn't have this. So it also hydrogen is like an exception. But hydrogen is also can give away one electron and still be happy, right? Because then it would have it wouldn't have a partially filled outermost shell. Because of that, because Oxygen has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So oxygen will tend to hold on to the electrons tighter than the hydrogen. So even though the hydrogen and oxygen are forming a covalent bond, they're technically sharing equally, but the sharing is not totally equally. The oxygen holds on to the electrons a little closer, tighter, and the hydrogen lets it go a little bit more, okay? And so that means most of the electrons are closer to the oxygen and further away from the hydrogen. And that means that on this end, the oxygen end of the water molecule, it is slightly more negative, And on the hydrogen end, it's slightly more positive. Okay, so water molecules have what are called a permanent dipole because of this shift in electrons. Okay. And so when you have water molecules next to each other, they're going to obviously have this attraction between the dipoles. The positive end will be attracted to the negative end, and so on and so forth. Okay? And this is one of the reasons that makes water have such a high surface tension. I don't know if anyone has ever thought about why when water falls out of your faucet, like if you have a slow drip in your kitchen sink and the water is coming out, it tends to form a ball right, before it falls all the way down. Has anyone ever thought about that? Like, why does it clump up before it falls down? Any thoughts about why that would be? Probably because of what we're just talking about, right? Because of the permanent dipole that water has. It has a very strong attraction to each other. So they will want to kind of stick together because of the hydrogen bonding. So they, the water molecules will accumulate until it becomes heavy enough where the gravity can break apart that hydrogen bond. And so it'll form this water droplet before it falls down. Okay. Any ideas about why it forms a spherical shape as opposed to any other shape? Why would it form a surface? I mean, why would it form a um, circle as opposed to, I don't know, a triangle or a rectangle, square? So remember what I said about the correct answer to any question I might ask in this class. Very good. <laughs> a, a sphere will have give the water molecule, the water clump, the lowest possible energy. And we'll talk about why that is. And when we talk about surfaces and things like that. But yes, the a spherical shape gives water, that droplet, the lowest possible overall energy, and therefore that's why it forms that shape, okay? And so the next time you're having a party and you're drinking alcohol, and if you try something, so next time you're at a party and if you're having 
a drink, you could try this when you're pouring, you know, when you pour water, if, like I said, if it slowly drips out, it forms a little ball before it falls down. But ethanol, which is the alcohol portion of any alcohol, so most of the things that you drink has mostly water, a little bit of alcohol, but the ethanol doesn't have this permanent dipole. And so it's not going to have the same amount of secondary bonding between the alcohol molecules. And so it will be much harder if you have a high alcohol content liquid to form a little droplet. So you might have, you could try to pour it really slowly, but you're going to just get a steady stream and not these droplets. And that's the reason for that is because it doesn't have permanent dipole. So it doesn't have a strong secondary bond. All right. So today we've talked about how two atoms or a few molecules, or sorry, a few atoms will behave as they come together, right? But we know that materials are made out of many, many more than just a few atoms. They're made up of hundreds of billions of atoms all together. So next week, we will talk about what happens when you have that many atoms come together. What happens to the electrons? What happens to the bonding? And how is that organized? Thank you.